We're in Exodus chapter 19. We will have a brief bit of review with regard to uh, what a dispensation is. And uh, for that, we'll just go back here and note that a dispensation is a period of time. We cannot emphasize this enough simply because there are some who say that a dispensation is not a period of time. It is included in an administration. You have to know when that administration is functioning. You have to know when something is dispensed. It's all included in the concept. Uh, a dispensation, therefore, is a period of time that is distinguished and defined by a specific divine revelation. God reveals himself, and from that moment onward until he reveals himself again, mankind is responsible for obeying that particular revelation. Each new revelation, therefore, is how God administers his will on earth. And uh, the seven uh, ones that we have are uh, distinct revelations of what God wants to do at that particular time. It's also his way of testing man uh, for his obedience. Man is responsible to own up to, to live according to, to comply with the updated information that uh, God gives. So therefore he is not responsible for any other dispensation but the one in which he lives as far as obedience is concerned. That's what makes dispensational truth extremely important because there are people today who are trying trying to obey Bible verses that don't apply to this dispensation. And though they are scripturally right, they're dispensationally wrong, and it makes them apostates and heretics. You have to comply with the information that is current. Now, sometimes when God gives information, uh, He will do two things. One, He will give new information that supersedes the old. Or, as we noted once again, the most outstanding example is that he will incorporate some of the old in with the new. And nine of the Ten Commandments, which are quoted by the Apostle Paul, uh, are uh, incorporated into those things that we're to obey in this dispensation. Now, therefore, we go all the way back. And there's always a debate as to how many dispensations there are. Well, the fact of the matter is, if a dispensation starts with a new revelation, all you have to do is go through the Bible and find each time that God gives a new revelation, and that does what? That starts a dispensation. How many times are there? There are seven times. Now, I want to make a, a comment with regard to the dispensation of law. There is added revelation to the original Mosaic installment. But um, all of it still does not contradict nor oppose what Moses wrote. Uh, Moses, uh, that is uh, the law and the prophets and the Psalms, all are in compliance with one another and are built on the basis of the original revelation. Even the new things that Jesus Christ um, uh, taught when he arrived were just simply that the law was to, to be applied to the inward man as well as the outward man. Because by the time Christ arrived, they simply uh, corrupted the law into a system of religion of external compliance to a ritual without any internal reality. So let's uh, just go back and look at the seven dispensations, the dispensation of innocence. Uh, man was not guilty of anything, but he was being tested. He was on probation. And again, that's what a dispensation is. Will man obey the revelation of God, or will he reject that revelation in favor of his own way, or corrupting uh, the word by just simply bringing all the information together and trying to obey all of the Bible rather than the current um, dispensational revelation. The only thing man had to obey under innocence was don't eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the only thing. Uh, as long as he did that, he would not sin. But we know that he did and he was ousted or evicted from the garden. But in so doing, 
he gave uh, man, God gave man, a new revelation. And that was in order to meet with him or have a relationship with him, he had to offer a blood sacrifice. Now, it's an interesting thing, as we've said several times, that by the time you get to the end of the dispensation of conscience, you have not only the revelation corrupted, but you have the genetics of man corrupted. You have the sons uh, of God, the angels, uh, intermingling uh, with the daughters of men, humans, and from that you got the Nephilim. And then from the text, we've looked at it many times, uh, there were other things going on with the animals. That's why all flesh had genetically corrupted itself. Now all there means per se, for the most part, in general, there were still some purebred animals and they were taken on the ark. But all others were killed simply because from those unions you get the Rephaim and God had to kill them all. So the dispensation of conscience, therefore, where God dealt with man by appealing strictly to his conscience, he didn't have the written revelation of God, he did have nature and the stars and so forth, but man corrupted that and his way upon the earth and God brought the flood. All right, from that then we get the dispensation of human government, where you have the patriarchal priesthood. Now, remember uh, in, in each of these things that you have to look at what God did by way of approach to him. Under the dispensation of human government, you have the head of the household as the representative of the family before God. Under the dispensation of law, you have a national priesthood in uh, the Levitical priesthood of Israel. In the dispensation of grace, you do not have a priesthood. What you have is the transfer of those duties to a pastor teacher. Uh, there is no other dispensation that has a local church as we have it in this dispensation. Uh, under law, you met God at uh, the uh, tabernacle or the temple. The same thing will be true with uh, the kingdom or their synagogues, but a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue is not a Gentile local church. It is different. And so that's the import of dispensational truth as well. Um, simply because in the kingdom, they will not have local churches like this. Uh, under law, they did not have local churches like this. Now, under any other dispensation, there was no local church. That makes us unique. We are the only dispensation that has the completed canon of Scripture. God does not speak audibly. We heard that in, in the excellent testimony that we had uh, this evening. God does not speak audibly, but God does speak. Uh, and He speaks in our hearts, but He speaks mainly in accordance with the Word. That's why academics are important in the dispensation of grace. He is a pastor teacher, and didaskalos means that he is a school teacher, but his subject is not reading, writing, and arithmetic, but spiritual things. The local church is a classroom where doctrine is to be learned. So that happens under grace, but we're getting ahead uh, of ourselves here, back to human government. Once again, the initial revelation of God was disobeyed. God said to mankind to multiply and scatter abroad on the face of the earth. But by the time we come to the end of the dispensation of human government, mankind has, was still together in the plain of Shinar, building a tower and a city so that they could disobey God. They felt uh, uh, comforted with the, the numerical advantage. Everybody was doing it. We're going to have one world government and one world religion. Well, by the time you get to the end of the dispensation of human government, uh, God confuses the languages, and we have to live with that uh, disparity today. And by the way, this is one of the good reasons why even in the dispensation of grace, we stand against things like the ecumenical movement. we got everybody coming together today. Don't care about what you believe. Just we're supposed to love one another and forget truth. 
The problem with that is it's been tried already and the uh, confusion of languages is God's answer to the ecumenical movement and one world government. And by the way, the end of the dispensation of grace, uh, or the dispensation of grace ends with the great tribulation where L Lucifer, through his man Antichrist, tries to bring the utopian kingdom, one world government, one world religion back on this planet. So we have a whole lot of people, sometimes even grace believers. Uh, that are now entering into this ecumenical move where we're just going to all be one. The problem is His Majesty the devil is doing the very same thing. That is his strategy. And you cannot join hands, as Paul said, mark them, which cause divisions contrary to the doctrine that you have learned and avoid them. How can you join hands with those who are rank apostates and heretics? You can't do it. So uh, under the dispensation of human government, we learn this principle that nationalism is what God wants, not internationalism. As long as you have nationalism, you can have a country that sends out missionaries, that supports missionaries, that allows freedom of worship and so forth for meetings just like this. It is not internationalism where one government and one religion monopolizes the whole. All right, then you come to the dispensation of promise. Where God called one man and said, I want you to stay in the land of Canaan. Well, uh, they didn't stay in the land of Canaan. They went to Egypt. And uh, what happened there is that their home was, the promises of God were that I'll pour out my blessings upon you, Israel, in the land. So if they went down to Egypt and uh, because there was a famine, once the famine was over, we asked the question, where should they have gone? Packed up their clothes and went back home where God said he would bless them. But instead they got comfortable in Egypt, a type of the world, and uh, the world will always enslave you when you get comfortable there. When you're not in the place where God will bless you, then you're going to be enslaved with those people that you... Um, uh, that you begin serving. It was, it's more important for them to live with the Egyptians. They always wanted to eat what the Egyptians ate, worship what the Egypt, Egyptians worship, uh, wear what the Egyptians were wearing and so forth. We don't want to be different. We want to be like the Egyptians. The problem is the Egyptians enslaved them just like the world will do when we compromise. So God had to bring them up out of Egyptian bondage and that brings us therefore to um, to the dispensation of law. Uh, Exodus chapter 19, and starting with verse number 5. And by the way, here is, um, as we start the dispensation of law, we're going to be bringing a critique and an expose against one of the most powerful ecumenical moves um, a foot today, and that is the promise keepers. And uh, we've got uh, people today who one of the very first statements they'll say is, see the man next to you, uh, he, he may be this, that, and the other of this religion, and it's totally false religion. He is your brother. Embrace him. The problem is, if they're not saved by grace through faith, they are not your brother. We're all the children of God by faith in Christ, not faith in works, not faith in baptism. It's faith alone in Christ alone. And uh, there, there's a problem with that. Their opening statement of these meetings is a lie. Now, the original Promise Keepers meeting, though, was, <laughs> was not uh, since 1990 in uh, Colorado. It's way back thousands of years ago when verse number five tells us, God speaking, now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now, he returned these words to the people, and what did the people say? Verse 8, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. What did they do? They made a promise. Now, somebody's going to ask, Pastor, if you don't make promises, if you don't make resolutions like we do every new year, what do you do? Well, we believe in 
positive faith perception here, learning the word, and positive faith production. It's not making a promise. It's volitionally entering into the system God has provided you. And uh, as long as you do that and you have doctrine, your spirituality will be sustained in the long run. Uh, promises just don't cut it. Now, it doesn't mean that you cannot have an overall dedication of life and commitment, but it simply means this. If you do not know the word of God and you cannot cycle doctrine to life, you are going to be a loser, uh, just as Jesus Christ would have been in his temptation. What did he do? Well, he didn't make a promise. Here's what he did. Lucifer said, make these stones bread. And he quoted a verse of scripture pertinent to the issue. A man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Lucifer said, jump off the temple. Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He quoted another verse of scripture pertinent to the issue. He did not make a promise. Oh God, I'll do better. Oh God, I failed. If he failed, we'd have never had salvation. He had to live up to, he had to produce spirituality, but he had to know the mechanics and the dynamics. And the last thing was, bow down and worship me. I'll give you, and Jesus quoted another verse of scripture, uh, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. It's it's positive faith production, not promises. People make promises all the time, and they're only as good until they get out of the uh, church service and get around uh, the world again, and then the promise is gone, just like New Year's resolutions. Uh, so we, we do not make promises, but what do we do? We have positive faith perception. We learn accurate doctrine. Then positive faith production. We bring that doctrine forth to life. Uh, and at any time we do that through the power of the Holy Spirit, then and then alone are we spiritual and pleasing to the Lord. They that are in the flesh, Romans 8, cannot please God. Okay, so what did Israel do? Second Kings chapter 17. Second Kings, chapter 17, and starting with verse number 7. I'll tell you what, let's, let's move on, let's move on down, um, rather than coming here. Uh, I know why. I, I know why it wasn't at the right place. <laughs> you have to be in the right book of the Bible. Second Kings chapter 17. Now, I'm getting someplace. For so it was, verse 7, that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh. They walked in the statutes, verse 8, of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. See, they were constantly impressed by other people. Uh, they wanted to know what the Egyptians were doing, what was in vogue with the Egyptians. Once God killed off the Egyptians, then the next uh, people were the, the Canaanites. And all of them weren't killed off, so they wanted to be, instead of leading them to spirituality and faith in Jehovah God, uh, they would rather rather conform to their standards and worship their gods. So what does God do? Verse number 19. Also Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord, but walked in the statutes of Israel, which they made. In other words, they were making covenants with the Canaanites and so forth. So the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them to the hands of the spoilers until he cast them out of his sight. Now, here's the thing with regard to the dispensation of law. By the time you get to the end of it, God makes a prediction about what is called theologically as the diaspora or the great dispersion. God is going to remove every Jew from the land out into the nations. And that's why uh, during a great portion of the dispensation of grace, no Jew lived in the land. They were dispersed. And God promised this if they would not adhere to his um, word. Deuteronomy chapter 28.
Deuteronomy chapter 28. Verse number 58. If you will not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book. You see, here, here is the thing. Israel would not obey what Moses wrote. God put up with them in several, uh, shall we say, more minor dispersions. They were a major at the time, but they were more minor dispersions off to Assyria, off to Babylonia and so forth. But for crucifying and rejecting their Messiah, it was going to be the grand dispersion of them all. And it happened in 70 AD when the temple and the city were destroyed and every Jew was removed, physically removed from off the land. Deuteronomy predicted it. Jesus um, elaborated on it. And again, it says, if you'll not observe, what is going to happen? Verse 63. It shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing. You'll be plucked from off the land, whether you go to possess it. Now, uh, they went off to Assyria. Some came back. They were known as the Samaritans, uh, and others were, remained their uh, genetic purity. Uh, they were taken off to uh, Babylon 70 years later. They came back and rebuilt the wall and the temple. But for thousands of years now, they have been removed from their land until uh, May 1948, when Israel was once again um, made a nation and recognized as such. But we're at the toward the end or the postponement of the dispensation of law. Look at verse 64. You'll be plucked off the land and the Lord shall scatter you among all people from one end of the earth, even to the other. You see, this happened at the end of the dispensation of law, after Jesus Christ was crucified, rejected, and after his post-cross, post-resurrection call for Israel to repent through the, through the apostles, they still would not bow down. So they were scattered to the nations, as Moses said one end of the earth to the other. In the Assyrian captivity, they just simply uh, went to Assyria. In the Babylonian captivity, they went to Babylon. But now they're scattered around the world, from one end of the earth even to the other, uh, and so forth. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. And we'll begin reading with verse number 20. Jesus Christ is going to comment on their scattering. He's going to make a prediction with regard to the fact that as Moses prophesied, declared they would be scattered, they will be. When you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Now, there is a time in the tribulation period when Israel will be compassed with armies. There'll be the armies of, of Antichrist. But this is not what this verse is talking about. This verse is talking about the armies of Titus, who started with Vespasian in 67 AD. Vespasian got called to Rome and his son Titus took over and fought uh, with uh, Israel for uh, three and a half years until he took the temple in the city in uh, between August and October of 70 AD. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains and so forth for these are the days of vengeance. Verse 24, they'll fall by the edge of the sword, but here is where he comments on what Moses wrote. 
and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Jesus Christ said this is something that would happen. Now, prior to this, God did something else. And the times between grace and law in both the entering and the exiting of the dispensation of grace, there are what is called transition periods. Because we believe that the dispensation of grace started with a brand new revelation. Okay? Now, people argue, well, did it start in Acts chapter 11? Did it start in Acts chapter 13? Did it start in Acts chapter 28? I'll tell you where it started. It's very simple. If the principle is a, re a dispensation starts with a new revelation, all you have to do is find out where the first revelation of Jesus Christ according to mystery occurred. Where was that? Very simple. In Acts chapter 9. That's all you have to do. Now, this is important, and we'll show you why in a moment. Acts chapter 9. Now remember that the 70 A.D. incident happened 30-some uh, odd years after this. There was a transition. And there will also be a transition back into the mystery of iniquity, says the Apostle Paul, is already working. But that especially means that it's going to begin working toward the end when the church is going to be raptured so that the tribulation period, as we have it here, uh, will be able to, um, to ensue. Because Antichrist can't be revealed as long as the body of Christ is on this earth. But that doesn't mean that there is not going to be a time when Lucifer is not going to begin setting the stage for the uh, tribulation period. But let's go to Acts chapter 9, and then we'll go to two portions that tell us exactly what happened in Acts chapter 9. The revelation of Jesus Christ according to the mystery. Where do you find in the scripture that Jesus Christ was going to come back to earth and reveal to Paul a brand new program, going to commission a new apostle, going to send him to the Gentiles apart from the Jews in Israel? Where's the first place you find that? Where is there something new that is done by the grace of God that was a mystery, that was not revealed? We find it in Acts 9. Verse 3, as he journeyed and came near Damascus, suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. He fell to earth and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, let's go from here to Acts chapter 22. Because there are two places in the scripture that comment on what happened when the Shekinah glory cloud came down. Jesus Christ was in there and the apostle Paul was in there. Two places that let us know the conversation that happened at this point in history. One is Acts chapter 22. All right, and it says there in verse number 10, what shall I do, Lord? And it says, arise, go to Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. And uh, Ananias, therefore, verse 12, a devout man came and told him. Now, the problem with that is, as many folks look at that and say, well, see, uh, there's not much different from what was said in Acts chapter 9. And that is true. Jesus said, there is a man is, that's going to come and he is going to fill you in on some things. But... I submit to you that Jesus Christ filled him in, as it were, in the Shekinah glory cloud. Turn to Acts chapter 26. And from verse 15 through verse number 20, we have the commission of Saul of Tarsus, who would become the Gentile apostle not later on, 
in Acts chapter 13, but in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 13, God the Holy Spirit separated him. That's true. But in Galatians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says, I'm an apostle by the will of God and by what member of the Godhead? Jesus Christ, not the Holy Spirit. It's the wrong member of the Godhead. Jesus Christ made him an apostle. Well, where did that happen? It happened in the Shekinah glory cloud on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. And here is further commentary on that. Verse 15, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting. But rise, stand on your feet, for I have appeared to thee for this purpose. Now note, what is the message we preach? The mystery or the appearing of Jesus Christ according to the mystery. When is the first mysterious appearing of Christ? Right here. It is not prophesied. You cannot find one verse where it says Jesus would do this. You cannot find one connection back to law except it's the same Savior. The king, the king of the, of the, um, of the Jews uh, is the savior of the world. And now instead of being proclaimed as king of the Jews, he's going to tell Paul, though he doesn't do it here, that he's been made head of the church and that he's going to go to the Gentiles away from Israel. Stand upon your feet for I've appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness of the things which you have seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto you, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send you. Noon, the Greek word now is not there in the original language, but now is implied. Uh, I'm sending you from here on out is the way that it reads. Uh, so from that point on out, he was commissioned as the apostle of the Gentiles and note, here is his message. What was the message of Peter just a year and a half before on the day of Pentecost? Repent and be baptized and you'll receive uh, the remission of sins and the Holy Spirit. Note Paul's message, brand new, totally different. To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they, the Gentiles, might receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them which are sanctified, note, by faith. It is not a message of baptism. The Apostle Paul got something brand new that was different from Peter from the start. Peter could never have preached that message. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Peter had to preach, <laughs> believe and be baptized and you'll be saved. And your baptism is a manifestation of your belief. So that's why uh, we, we say this because the great commission for Israel and Peter was go forth to all nations, baptizing them. Right here in the Shekinah glory cloud, Jesus Christ says, Paul, um, baptism is not associated with the grace message by faith. Just Gentiles, all they have to do is believe. They do not have to submit to one ritual that was given under the law. All right, let's, let's look. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Show to them of Damascus, Jerusalem, throughout all Judea and so forth, uh, that they should change their mind, turn to God, and uh, manifest a life that is fitting for a changed mind. So that happens here. Now, let's go to Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter four, and we'll note the ending of the dispensation of grace. And the reason that we do this is that Titus says, looking uh, for the glorious appearing of the great God and our savior, Jesus Christ. We all know that to be an event called the rapture where Jesus Christ will reveal himself to the body of Christ in the earth's atmosphere and call those that are alive and remain and those that are dead in Christ from, from Paul onward uh, home to be with himself. The interesting thing about this is 
We've, all, we've argued theologically for years about where the body of Christ starts. It, it's interesting. Where does it end? With a glorious appearing. Well, if it ends with a glorious appearing according to mystery, that is not an unprophesied event, all you have to do is find the glorious appearing that begins it. And of course, the only other glorious appearing is where Jesus Christ showed himself to Saul of Tarsus in an unprophesied event. In a, you call it the, uh, there was a song out, the world had out, the great balls of fire. Well, you got one that ends it and you got one that begins it. And those are the parameters of the dispensation of grace. Argue what you will. It starts there. It has to. That's where the revelation begins, uh, the dispensation of grace. For every dispensation starts with a new revelation. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Here is the end of grace and the end of our time as well. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Now, mind you, he is not talking uh, like Jesus talked to the sisters of Lazarus, Mary and Martha. He said, uh, uh, your brother will rise again. She said, yeah, I know that he'll rise again at the last day. Lazarus will not be in this resurrection. Lazarus will not be brought forth. Lazarus is not a member of the body of Christ. That resurrection she's talking about doesn't happen until the end of the tribulation period where the uh, Old Testament saints and the tribulation martyrs will get their, their uh, glorified bodies. This takes us back to every saint from Paul to the point of the rapture. Only those members have been baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, those members of the body of Christ, will God bring with him. What's he going to do? Verse 16. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, voice of the archangel, trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So you have both the beginning and the ending of the dispensation of grace, and the message we preach for, uh, given to Paul initially. Now there's much more, of course, with all of his epistles. But the initial message here is, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. For Christ sent me not to baptize, he said to the Corinthians. All right, let's, let's go back here and bring this to a close. During the dispensation of grace, Israel's is dispersed to the nations, but Paul goes out to the nations so that they too come under the banner of his ministry. If a Jew gets saved in the dispensation of grace, it's not in accordance with the Mosaic law. It's with the tenets of Paul's message given to him by Jesus Christ during that transition period. We do not go out under the Great Commission. We go out under the commission given to us as the Apostle Paul. We are ambassadors, therefore, Jesus Christ.